Hey guys, today I'll show you a psychological horror TV series named Uramiya Hanpo, 2006 The Series. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story begins with a woman in white falling from a high building, dying instantly on the scene. A mysterious woman named Uramiya happened to pass by there, briefly pausing before leaving the place. The police that arrived thought there was something unusual about Uramiya but couldn't quite put a finger on it. The father of the dead woman, Ito, believed that his daughter was killed by her husband, Ajiyama. He hoped the police could apprehend Ajiyama as the real culprit. However, since the police could not find any evidence, they could only conclude that the woman in white had terminated herself. Thus, they were unable to investigate further. Upon her death, Ajiyama stood to gain a 100 million insurance payout. This led everyone to suspect that he was involved in his wife's death. The woman in white was Ajiyama's third wife. His first wife met with an accident while bathing and drowned in the bathtub. His second wife got killed in a traffic accident. Although Ajiyama was suspected of serious insurance fraud, the police simply couldn't find the evidence to prove it, leaving them helpless. Ito, unable to avenge his daughter, lived in guilt every day. In a fit of rage, he decided to kill Ajiyama himself. On his way to exact revenge, Ito bumped into Uramiya. Uramiya seemed to know about Ito's situation and warned him that his foolish revenge would only destroy himself. Ito was stunned for a moment and tried to stop Uramiya, but the mysterious woman had walked away and vanished into thin air without even a trace of her smell. He then realized there was a business card in his jacket pocket. The card read, Uramiya Honpo, eliminate your resentment. So Ito contacted Uramiya based on the card. Uramiya told Ito that the mother of Ajiyama's second wife had also contacted her. But before she could investigate, the father of the second wife couldn't stand it anymore. He wanted to die along with Ajiyama because his daughter had died in a car accident. He wanted Ajiyama to die the same way. But on their way to exact revenge, the couple got into a car accident and both died. That's why Uramiya had previously warned Ito not to be impulsive. Uramiya's company had many excellent employees who could help Ito. They could ensure a clean job without leaving any evidence, and even make the scene look like an accident. However, the fee was too high for Ito to accept right away. After careful consideration, Ito decided to sell his house and land, just to ensure Ajiyama would disappear from this world. Upon receiving the task, Uramiya immediately visited her business partner named Hoya, who excelled at searching for information. He provided Uramiya with a suitable candidate for the job. As long as the price was right, he could even find the bank account numbers of national politicians. However, there was one thing he could not find, Uramiya's personal history. Uramiya then called Ajiyama to taunt him, stating that she would create an accident. She warned him to be careful, as an assassin would soon pay him a visit. Shortly after, Ajiyama's doorbell rang. It was a new neighbor who had just moved in next door. After some polite conversation, the neighbor suddenly changed his tone, expressing admiration for Ajiyama's scheme of killing his wife for insurance money. He thought it was a great idea and wanted to try it himself. Startled, Ajiyama quickly shut the door, but the neighbor assured Ajiyama that he was not an assassin. Still, he warned Ajiyama to be careful and avoid accidents. In reality, the neighbor was sent by Uramiya, in addition to payment, Uramiya had given him a weapon capable of delivering a fatal blow to Ajiyama. On the other side, while Ajiyama was taking a bath, the water temperature began to rise. The thermostat had malfunctioned, and Ajiyama was nearly scalded before he managed to turn it off. A repairman told him that the thermostat was actually fine, and that someone with a similar remote control had likely manipulated the temperature from outside. Not long after the repairman left, Ajiyama ran into his neighbor, who brandished a TV remote control to scare him, warning him not to mess with him without evidence. Unable to bear it, Ajiyama resolved to find evidence and press charges against his neighbor. However, as soon as he hit the road, he discovered that his car's brakes were failing. In the end, to avoid hitting a pedestrian, he crashed into a pile of garbage. These two accidents were eerily similar to the deaths of his previous wives. Ajiyama, feeling wronged, proclaimed to the media that he too was a victim and pleaded to not be labeled a wife killer. The next time Ajiyama opened his door, he was taunted by his neighbor again. The neighbor held up a wrench, implying that he was behind everything. He even suggested that Ajiyama would end up killing himself by jumping off the building, just like the woman in white. A journalist, who had been secretly photographing the scene, noticed something was amiss and pointed his camera at Ajiyama and his neighbor. 
The neighbor, pretending to push Ajiyama off the building, frightened him. In his panic, Ajiyama pushed the neighbor, who used Ajiyama's strength to deliberately fall off the building, and the footage taken by the journalist made it appear as if he was pushed by Ajiyama. After accomplishing his task, the neighbor smiled as he fell, leaving Ajiyama to be accused of murder. Ajiyama informed the police about his ordeal, but they found no supporting evidence. In Ajiyama's car, they discovered an insurance policy with the neighbor as the insured and Ajiyama's company as the beneficiary. Given the incriminating footage from the journalist, Ajiyama was left speechless. The police finally arrested Ajiyama for murder and insurance fraud. With the charges mounting against him, Ajiyama was facing the death penalty. Now, although Ito had avenged his daughter, he couldn't rejoice. Even if his resentment was gone, his daughter wouldn't return, and the life of the neighbor was also sacrificed. However, Uramiya didn't see the neighbor as a victim. She had once saved him when he was about to end his own life due to debt. She convinced him that if he had to die, it should be meaningful and not a worthless death. The neighbor was willing to give up his life so that his wife and children could have a better future with the insurance payout. As long as there were people willing to pay to eliminate their resentment, there would be people willing to pay with their lives. This is how Uramiya and her company profited from this kind of business. Afterwards, a young policeman believed that the mysterious woman Uramiya mentioned by Ajiyama didn't really exist, but Officer Satoshi felt that things weren't that simple. The second story begins with a female CEO hiring a gigolo to alleviate her loneliness. However, upon discovering her identity, he used it to intimidate her, frequently demanding money. Although they had agreed that this would be the last time, the gigolo reneged on his promise and claimed he would continue to extort her. When he saw the CEO attempting to escape, he quickly grabbed her and showed her a video he had secretly filmed. He had captured their transactions on tape. If he turned this recording into a CD, the CEO's reputation would be destroyed and the gigolo would suffer no loss. Enraged, the CEO lashed out with a torrent of curses. In a nearby alley, a drug dealer was completing a transaction with a girl. As soon as the deal was over, the policeman appeared. Upon seeing the officers, the three individuals scattered in different directions. One of the girls collided with the CEO while fleeing and cursed at her. Uramiya, who happened to be passing by, squatted down to help the CEO pick up her things and once again brushed past Officer Satoshi. After Uramiya left, the CEO discovered a business card in her bag that read Uramiya Hanpo. Following the information on the card, the CEO contacted Uramiya. She had only been playing around, but the gigolo had recorded it all. Therefore, she asked Uramiya to retrieve the tape and annihilate the gigolo. Given the gigolo's despicable behavior, Uramiya asked for only five million, a sum the CEO considered negligible. The person assigned to this task was her assistant, Shu. Initially, Shu planned to teach the gigolo a lesson physically, but Uramiya had a rule. In this line of work, only the brain is used, not violence. Therefore, he had to outsmart the gigolo. After a quick makeover, Shu arrived at the club where the gigolo worked and officially became a member. Thanks to his good looks and high social intelligence, he quickly became the club's top performer, spending his days mingling with wealthy women. This infuriated the gigolo, who had fallen out of favor. At the weekly summary meeting, Shu received praise from the manager and became a role model for the others. Knowing that he would starve if this continued, the gigolo decided to steal Shu's bonus. However, Shu had been waiting for him. He had placed a camera on the storage locker in advance, capturing the entire theft. The gigolo couldn't believe that Shu had been on guard all along. Faced with the loss of his job, the gigolo attacked Shu in his rage. But he was no match for Shu. If it wasn't for Uramiya's rule, the gigolo would have been beaten to a pulp. On the other side of town, Officer Satoshi, investigating a drug case, tracked down a lead pointing to the thug boss. He suspected a connection between Thug Boss and the previous drug dealer, but Thug Boss denied any involvement, claiming he was merely running a regular trading company. Lacking concrete evidence, Satoshi was helpless to act further. Meanwhile, Uramiya was also investigating Thug Boss and decided to use him to get rid of the gigolo. Upon Uramiya's request, Hoya sent an email to all the male escorts in Japan. This email contained a video of the gigolo stealing a fellow escort's bonus. This consequently ruined the gigolo's reputation in his profession, as everyone in the industry began to shun him. Despite interviewing at many clubs, the gigolo returned unemployed each time. Even the wealthy women he once entertained no longer answered his calls. As he wallowed in frustration, Uramiya suddenly approached the gigolo, pretending to have received a text from him. 
The gigolo, who had been with countless women, had lost track of who was who and therefore mistook Uramiya for an easy target. Uramiya then led him to a restaurant she frequented often. After a few drinks, Uramiya began to seduce the gigolo. Just as he was about to take advantage of the situation, he suddenly felt dizzy and passed out. Before leaving, Uramiya took the gigolo's phone and casually tossed it into a fish tank. When the gigolo woke up, he found himself in an office. Recalling the previous night's events, he realized he had been drugged. Without a phone to contact anyone, he wandered around the office. To his surprise, he found that the office safe was open. In his lucky break, the gigolo discovered a package of white powder in the safe. At that moment, Thug Boss and his men arrived. Thug Boss mistook the gigolo for a drug thief. Just then, one of Thug Boss's men found a scratch on Thug Boss's car. With the culprit and evidence at hand, they concluded that the gigolo was responsible. Thug Boss demanded 30 million in compensation from the gigolo, threatening dire consequences otherwise. Without a way to contact anyone for help, the gigolo had no choice but to return home. He had secretly filmed many wealthy women in the past, so he thought he could use those videos to extort the needed money. However, upon reaching home, he found that all the videos were gone. Refusing to admit defeat, the gigolo pretended to search other rooms, then escaped through a window when the guard wasn't looking. He ran to a public phone booth and quickly called the police. Thug Boss's men arrived shortly after, beating the gigolo senseless before tossing him into a car. It turns out the gigolo's belongings had been stolen by Shu. Uramiya only wanted the address book and the secretly filmed videos, allowing Shu to keep whatever else he found. As a punishment from Thug Boss, the gigolo was destined to be sent to Southeast Asia to serve as a plaything for the local tycoons. After everything ended, the CEO couldn't help but feel a bit of regret. She wondered if she had gone too far. Uramiya reminded her that for people like the gigolo, if you don't eliminate them entirely, they would only come back to retaliate much more. So she must not show mercy. On the other hand, Officer Satoshi obtained the recording of the gigolo's emergency call. Although the gigolo didn't explicitly state in the recording that he was set up by Uramiya, the officer had already guessed as much, thinking the mysterious woman could manipulate others so easily. The third story begins with a girl named Rina taking a bath one night, when her stepfather barged into the bathroom saying he wanted to join her. Her mother was on the night shift at the hospital that night, leaving Rina unprotected. Next door lived a beautiful housewife. As soon as her husband got home, she couldn't wait to become intimate with him. Little did they know, their panting was being eavesdropped on by the caretaker of the apartment building. The next day, the caretaker was still monitoring the couple. When housewife went out to take out the trash after her husband left for work, the caretaker appeared with a bag of dog poop. She emptied the bag into housewife's mailbox, then went downstairs to inspect the trash housewife had just thrown out. The caretaker had the authority to inspect whether residents had properly sorted their trash. After rummaging through the trash bag, she finally found non-burnable garbage and proceeded to berate housewife. After tidying up the trash, housewife once again encountered the caretaker who was spreading rumors about housewife, saying she was being unfaithful to her husband. Unable to prove her innocence, housewife could only stomp off in anger. The moment she opened her door, she found the dog poop the caretaker had dumped. Meanwhile, the caretaker had arrived with two other neighbors. Housewife suspected the caretaker was behind it, but without any evidence, she couldn't do anything. Why did the caretaker hate housewife so much? On the surface, it was because housewife and her husband's smelly exercise was too loud. The real reason, however, was the house. The caretaker and her deceased husband had worked most of their lives to buy that apartment, but now with the property prices dropping, housewife and her husband had easily moved in, causing her immense dissatisfaction. This led her to deliberately pick on Housewife. Housewife told her husband about her ordeal, but he didn't care. Helpless, Housewife could only think of a way to get revenge on her own. She searched online for information about revenge and was drawn to a website called Uramiya Honpo. Through the website, Housewife contacted Uramiya. She initially considered this a trivial matter, but Housewife was insistent on seeking revenge. With no other choice, they agreed to help her, charging a fee of one million. Housewife thought the service was too expensive and tried to negotiate a discount to 300000 Uramiya agreed but warned her that they would only do work worth that amount and she shouldn't expect too much. After accepting the task, Uramiya suddenly noticed Rina sitting by the roadside contemplating suicide, so she threw the girl her business card. Meanwhile, Shu even discovered the caretaker's dissatisfaction. He didn't understand why one would project their hatred onto a neighbor who had bought their house at a low price. 
Uramiya only told him that women were such strange creatures. On the other hand, the caretaker continued to frame housewife. Everyone else's mail disappeared, only housewives remained, making her the suspect of stealing the mail. Rena was also dealing with the same situation, still suffering abuse from her stepfather. Surprisingly, he even knew how to pick locks. He threatened Rena, saying that he had the image of a gentleman on the outside. No one would believe her if she reported him. Rena had no choice but to swallow her rage. While passing by a boutique, Rena suddenly had a greedy thought and planned to steal a bracelet she liked. Luckily, Officer Satoshi, who happened to be passing by, stopped her in time. He sternly lectured her, saying that evil people would eventually get their comeuppance. If he saw her misbehaving again, he would definitely arrest her. After the officer left, Rena muttered that if it were true, her stepfather would have already received his punishment. After much hesitation, Rena decided to call Uramiya for help. Upon understanding the situation, she asked Rena if she wanted her stepfather killed. Although Rena despised her stepfather, his death would devastate her mother. So she asked Uramiya if they could find a way to make her stepfather move out. Uramiya quoted a price of three million, a sum Rena couldn't afford. Therefore, Uramiya proposed that once the task was completed, Rena would repay the debt with her body. Desperate for revenge, Rena agreed. The next day, housewife returned home to find her lock blocked and promptly called Uramiya to expedite their actions, as she was being driven crazy by the nosy caretaker. Shortly after the call, housewife discovered her car tires had been deflated and the body scratched. Her car lock was also blocked. Meanwhile, the caretaker had bribed the other neighbors with fancy pastries to help find the mail housewife was accused of stealing. She had received a call the day before from someone who claimed to have seen housewife taking the mail and warned that housewife would seize the first opportunity to destroy it. The three women waited downstairs for housewife. Upon her arrival, they began inspecting her garbage, only to find it meticulously sorted and devoid of any stolen mail. Desperate to pin something on housewife, they checked the adjacent garbage bag and found the missing mail. Just when they thought they had evidence against housewife, they noticed the box from the caretaker's fancy pastries in the same bag, revealing it was the caretaker's trash. The caretaker hastily tried to explain that she had only disposed of dog poop, but the scene became even more awkward. After apologizing to housewife, the neighbors left sheepishly. It turned out that all of this, except for the dog poop, was orchestrated by Uramiya to set up the caretaker and expose her. They disregarded housewife's feelings because she had only paid 300000 and would thus only receive work worth that amount, as was agreed from the start. When Rena's stepfather returned home from work, he found a note from Rena saying she was taking a bath and asked him to wait in the room. Overjoyed, he thought he had finally won Rena over and anticipated no further resistance from her. However, instead of finding Rena, he was met by a burly man who lunged at him. The stepfather eventually moved out, not out of fear of being harassed by the burly man, but because he had found his true love. That night, the burly man had completely won him over, and he had come to terms with his own nature. Based on the deal, Rena had thought that Uramiya would take her to a brothel to sell her body to repay the debt. However, when Uramiya mentioned repaying the debt with her body, they simply meant Rena would work for them. Once her wages covered the debt, she would be free again. The fourth story begins with a newlywed couple, Shinji and his wife, their marriage just three months old. While they were planning their future, three teenagers suddenly confronted them. Without a word, they attacked the couple and forcefully dragged them into a car. The teenagers took Shinji and his wife to an abandoned factory, where they threatened Shinji's life and forced his wife to strip for explicit photos. Unable to bear the humiliation, Shinji declared he'd rather die than see his wife succumb. He was then stabbed by the gang leader, who threatened the wife that they were all minors and they would be protected by the law. Seeing Shinji's life in danger, the wife had no choice but to undress. Dissatisfied, the gang leader demanded her to kneel and call him master. After she choked out the word master, the three boys burst into laughter. The scene then switched to the street where Shinji, looking at his wife's photo, was in intense pain. Soon, the Uramiya found him and left her business card by his side. Meanwhile, Officer Satoshi started to investigate the three teenagers. The crime scene only had bodily fluids left, and Shinji wasn't able to provide any useful clues, making the case difficult to solve. Shinji had been knocked unconscious while his wife was being violated, so he didn't know that the teenagers had later forced his wife to consume excrement. The officer was furious upon hearing that, but even if they were caught, they might not be charged with assault because they were minors. On the other hand, Shinji was recounting the incident to Uramiya. When he woke up, the three teenagers had already left, and the lifeless body of his wife was hanging in front of him. 
The police concluded after an autopsy that Shinji's wife had killed herself, unable to bear the humiliation. Actually, Shinji had noted the license plate number of the teenager's car during the struggle. He didn't tell the police about this clue because he knew it would be useless. The law would protect the teenagers. That's why he sought out Uramiya's help. Uramiya asked for 30 million in total for the three individuals. Shinji was willing to pay any amount as long as they were sent to hell. On the way to Hoya's house, Uramiya suddenly noticed a strange man named Suda, who ran frantically towards the corner of the street. Sensing something unusual about this man, Uramiya decided to follow him. It turns out that Suda lived next door to Hoya and was his new neighbor. After Hoya found out about the three teenagers' backgrounds, he decided to take matters into his own hands. Elsewhere, Officer Satoshi was still investigating but had found no leads. He then ran into Rina, someone he had met before. Rina initially thought he was there to cause trouble, but it was just a routine investigation. Unaware of the case, Rina could not provide any clues. Switching back to the three teenagers, they showed no remorse after their crime. They even modified their vehicle and contemplated repeating their offenses. It turns out that Shinji's wife didn't kill herself, but was instead murdered by them. They were laughing and planning their next move, unknown that their conversation was being monitored by Uramiya. Hearing how they treated murder like a game, Hoya grew restless. Uramiya then found Rina and gave her a necklace. Afterward, she assigned her the first task that could clear a debt of 300,000. Following Uramiya's instructions, Rina went to an internet cafe and began spreading the heinous acts of the three teenagers online, including revealing the leader's identity. Apart from the internet, Rina also spread the word in person, and the news quickly spread throughout society. On the other hand, Hoya, disguised as a lawyer, confronted two of the teenagers. He played back their previous conversation about their next plan. He even told them that the leader had recorded the conversation and tasked Hoya with contacting the victim Shinji. If Shinji agreed not to pursue the leader's responsibility, he would give up his two followers. This was actually Uramiya's scheme to sow discord among the group. Given their mistrust for each other, this plan worked effectively. While Rina was spreading news of the leader's murderous actions, she was discovered by the leader. He knocked Rina out with a punch and took her to an abandoned factory. Thanks to the camera inside the necklace given by Uramiya, they quickly discovered this. They immediately called the other two teenagers. On his way to rescue Rina, Hoya encountered the mysterious Suda. Unexpectedly, Suda demonstrated agility and jumped onto a power pole in an instant. Inside the abandoned factory, the gang leader was interrogating Rina, demanding to know who was behind her actions. Just as Rina was about to get hurt, the two teenagers suddenly showed up. Seizing the moment, Rina claimed that she was acting under the orders of these two. The leader, who had been suspicious that his two followers might have betrayed him, now had an excuse to take action. The two also believed that their leader had sold them out, which led to a fight between them. Although the leader was at a disadvantage initially, his fighting experience turned the tide in his favor. Seeing this, the two pulled out their knives. The leader also drew his own knife. By the time Uramiya and Hoya arrived, the three boys had killed each other in their strife. Upon seeing Uramiya, Rina couldn't help but throw herself into her arms. With that, the incident came to a close. News of the three boys killing each other in their strife quickly made the newspapers. Officer Satoshi sighed after hearing the news and once again passed by Uramiya without realization. Upon understanding the course of events, Shinji once again lamented the police's incompetence and was glad he had seeked help from Uramiya. Without them, his wife wouldn't have been able to rest in peace. In the end, Uramiya and Hoya debated whether it was appropriate for them to enforce the law in place of the police. Although the law allows for the death penalty at 18, in reality, there are virtually no precedents. It's even less likely that the victim's families would be satisfied. The fifth story begins with an actor, Taro, who is well known among kids with the character he plays, Cyber Detective K. Not far from the fan meeting site, a woman named Kida is hiding in the shadows, spying. It turns out she's Taro's secret fan, stalking him and collecting all information about him whenever she gets the chance. Seeing Taro hail a cab home, she immediately stops one too and follows him into the elevator. Although Taro feels uncomfortable with Kita's presence, he doesn't say anything. Just as he's about to exit the elevator, Kita suddenly stuns him with a taser. When Taro wakes up, he finds himself naked in bed with Kita. Kita tells Taro that he was impressive last night and that she's now carrying his child. It turns out that Kita has serious delusions. She believes that she and Taro, or rather the character K he plays in the drama, were lovers in a past life. 
Seeing him being intimate with other women in the drama upsets her. Taro pleads with her to distinguish reality from fiction, reminding her that he's just an actor, but Kita won't listen. She even thinks that Taro has lost his memory due to some accident. Seeing no escape, Taro can only pretend to faint and see how things unfold. Kita decides to spray him with water to wake him up, so Taro kicks her in the face and stuns her with her own taser. Since Kita knows Taro's address, he must move. Just as he finishes moving his belongings to his new place, he hears someone ringing the doorbell. He can't believe how quickly Kita found him. Taro opens the door quickly, causing it to hit Kita and knock her out. On the other hand, Taro runs to a phone booth intending to call the police, but he finds a business card that says, Eliminate your resentment. That's how he contacts Uramiya. He tells her that this secret fan is terrifying and that he's been tormented these past few days. If this continues, he'll have a mental breakdown. He pleads with them to teach her a lesson. Uramiya asks for two million and tells Taro to move to a hotel in the meantime, so when Kita shows up, they can investigate her background. It turns out Kita works in the government, therefore she can easily access other people's information. Because of her low efficiency at work, she often attracts the disdain of others. A passerby grumbles that Kita doesn't even count as a woman. Kita keeps this in mind. As soon as the passerby leaves, Kita opens his personal data and makes a copy. She then goes to a public phone booth, disguises her voice as a man, and pretends to be the passerby, ordering sushi for ten people. This is her way of revenge. The one to execute this mission is Shu, who believes he's much more handsome than Taro and should have no problem dealing with Kita. However, Kita shows no interest in him at all, and even says he has a face like a duck. Shu, who prides himself on his ability to charm women, is greatly hurt. Uramiya says Kita's thinking is very special. To deal with someone like her, they have to find someone even crazier to hassle her. And that person is Suda, the strange man who appeared in the previous episode. Suda also enjoys watching the drama starring Taro and is a bit of a delusional fanatic. Hoya contacts Suda claiming to be his boss from a past life. He then instructs Suda to open his mailbox, which contains Kita's personal information. Hoya tells Suda that Kita was his wife in a past life, but she's got a problem now. She believes her other half is Cyber Detective K, so he must win her back. As Hoya explains the mission in the context of the drama, Suda doesn't doubt it and immediately starts the mission. Kita has been waiting at Taro's house for a week, but no one shows up. Just as she's puzzled, Suda appears. Without saying anything, he runs towards Kita, who thinks he's a madman and runs away. As Suda chases her, he tries to brainwash her, saying that she was his wife in a past life. Kita screams for help in a chicken voice, saying there's a pervert who likes to catch a chicken. Seeing no way out, she uses a stone to knock Suda unconscious. But Suda isn't discouraged and keeps chasing her. Kita thought she had escaped, but then she receives a call from Suda. Not long after, Suda is by her side. Since she can't escape, she decides to fight. She thought there would be a showdown, but she ends the fight with a kick to Suda's groin. But Suda doesn't give up and says he'll definitely make her fall in love with him again. Kita escapes back home. She grumbles that stalkers like Suda are super annoying. As she's about to close the window, she's shocked to find that Suda has climbed up to her balcony, saying that he is going to shoot her with the ray of love. Seeing that Kita uses the same marker as him, Suda is even more convinced that Kita must have been his wife in a past life. Otherwise, they wouldn't be so in sync. After escaping from Suda, Kita tries to escape from the balcony, but sadly, she's not agile enough. Suda tries to pounce on Kita, but she dodges with her heavy body, causing him to fall off the balcony. But being agile, Suda isn't troubled by the fall. Kita, almost driven mad, decides to call the police. Officer Satoshi arrives quickly after receiving the call, but Suda ignores him. Then Hoya calls, announcing a new mission to him, and Suda leaves. Uramiya finds it funny that Kita would actually call the police. But they guess that even if people like her killed someone, they'd still feel like they're the victims. On the other side, after obtaining information about Suda, Kita prepares to retaliate against him. Unexpectedly, the former passerby appears out of the blue, seeking an explanation from Kita. He received a complaint that Kita had been ordering food in his name, causing chaos. Subsequently, everyone Kita had retaliated against came to demand an explanation. It turns out they were tipped off by Uramiya. Kita pretends to be ignorant and claims they have no evidence against her. Just as Kita is gloating, her superior suddenly notices Kita's computer. She had forgotten to close the web page when she was searching for Suda. Now, under these circumstances, Kita still tries to play innocent, claiming her hands are uncontrollable and would randomly press keys. Of course, the superior does not believe her bullshit and has her kicked out. 
The public becomes aware of Kita's actions, revealing that their information is often leaked. The representative of the government has no choice but to issue an apology statement. Kita loses her job and returns to her hometown and will no longer pester Taro. However, Suda has not let her go and even follows her to her hometown. After the incident, Taro says his participation in a certain series has fallen through and wants to use this to lower the payment to Uramiya. Understanding his intention, Uramiya immediately gives him a few photos. The photos are evidence of him flirting with underage girls. If this matter were to spread, the image he has built would be ruined. Therefore, he can only obediently pay up. Meanwhile, Officer Satoshi discovers a photo of a blue butterfly in the archive room. Uramiya has many of these butterflies, indicating that the officer might be close to identifying Uramiya. The sixth story begins with a suspicious man slipping out from a residence. He has committed a murder. The victim is the homeowner, Nanjo. In the last moments of his life, Nanjo thinks of his beloved wife, Miyuki. Not long after, Officer Satoshi arrives on the scene, notifying Miyuki of Nanjo's death. He carefully investigates the scene, but finds no useful clues. At Nanjo's memorial service, a familiar voice emerges. It's Uramiya, who is distributing her business cards again. While Miyuki is looking through the condolence gifts from the guests, she finds Uramiya business card. Thus, she contacts Uramiya later. Miyuki believes the murderer of her husband is Tanoshima, who had previously worked in Nanjo's company and dated Miyuki for a while. After their breakup, Miyuki married Nanjo. However, Tanoshima continued to pester Miyuki and was subsequently fired by Nanjo. Tanoshima, harboring resentment, even made threatening phone calls to Miyuki, saying he would kill Nanjo out of vengeance for his lost love. Miyuki originally thought he was joking, but now that her husband has been killed, Tanoshima must be the murderer. Miyuki admits that she and her husband had a 20-year age gap, but she genuinely loved him. Therefore, she pleads with Uramiya to avenge her husband and kill Tanoshima. Uramiya quotes a fee of 10 million with a security deposit of 1 million, which is nothing for Miyuki, given Nanjo's assets worth nearly 100 billion. Later, Officer Satoshi approaches Miyuki, asking her to provide clues. Since Nanjo was stabbed 20 times by the killer, it's clear this was a case of revenge. Therefore, he hoped she could inform if Nanjo had any enemies. As Miyuki had already sought help from Uramiya, Uramiya did not provide any information to the police. However, this time, the officer senses that Miyuki is deliberately withholding information and asks his partner to investigate her background. Meanwhile, Hoya conducts an investigation and finds that, indeed, Tanoshima is a prime suspect, just as Miyuki claimed. Suddenly, Tanoshima calls Miyuki, but she doesn't answer. This puzzles Tanoshima since it was Miyuki who instigated him. That day, when Nanjo met Tanoshima, he planned to pay him off. However, Tanoshima stabbed him 20 times instead. He believes that Miyuki only loved Nanjo's money and that he was her true love. After Nanjo's death, Miyuki starts spending money lavishly on shopping sprees. All of this is observed by Uramiya. It seems this case isn't as simple as it appears. In the evening, Miyuki is intercepted by Tanoshima on her way home. He questions why Miyuki has been avoiding him, only to be met with her scorn. She berates him, saying that if she cozy up to him right after her husband's death, it would only raise suspicions from the police. After this outburst from Miyuki, Tanoshima comes to his senses and promptly leaves. Just then, Uramiya appears. It turns out that Miyuki and Tanoshima conspired to kill Nanjo. Now Miyuki wants to kill Tanoshima to silence him and has thus contacted Uramiya. Since Uramiya is now aware of everything, Miyuki admits that she only married Nanjo for his money and didn't love him at all. She plans to add an additional 10 million to have Uramiya take Tanoshima's life. However, Uramiya refuses, stating that she won't commit murder without a grudge, no matter how much she offers, and she will stick to her principles. This infuriates Miyuki. She says that Uramiya will surely end up killing Tanoshima. One day, after being intimate with Tanoshima, Miyuki breaks up with him, saying that a woman has discovered her secret and is now blackmailing her daily. Upon hearing this, Tanoshima is upset and threatens to kill the woman. Consequently, Miyuki gives him Uramiya's phone number. Tanoshima will then attempt to lure Uramiya out to kill her. However, as Uramiya is likely a formidable opponent, Tanoshima will probably end up being killed instead. Miyuki silently laughs, thinking her plan is flawless. On the other hand, Uramiya receives a call from Tanoshima. He says he has prepared 100 million and asks Uramiya to come and get it when she has time. Uramiya, not understanding what he's talking about, hangs up the phone. When Tanoshima calls again, Uramiya activates her search feature, quickly finding his information and revealing his identity. This shocks Tanoshima. Uramiya arranges to meet him in the park at 3 p.m. the day after tomorrow. 
Although this suits Tanoshima's intentions, he can't help but feel uneasy. He feels like he has lost control over the situation. To resolve this matter, Uramiya decides to break her rules. She removes her wig, returning to her original appearance. She believes that revealing her unknown true appearance is also a kind of disguise. Uramiya decides to change the mission. She will use Miyuki's money to eliminate Miyuki herself. Meanwhile, Officer Satoshi had also turned his attention to Tanoshima, keeping him under surveillance. When Uramiya was seen leaving Tanoshima's home, it raised Satoshi's suspicion. He felt he had seen this woman somewhere before, but he couldn't act rashly and alert the suspect. After a while, Tanoshima also left his house, prompting Satoshi to follow him. It turned out that Tanoshima was meeting with Miyuki. He then exposed Miyuki's lies. It turns out that Uramiya had been pretending to be an insurance company employee. She falsely claimed that Miyuki had taken out a 1 billion life insurance policy on Tanoshima. As the two weren't from the same family, the insurance company needed to conduct a routine inquiry. At the time of the policy signing, a woman with long hair was present with Miyuki. Upon hearing this, Tanoshima understood why Uramiya knew his identity. It had all been revealed by Miyuki, such a greedy woman. After Nanjo's death, she had already inherited billions, yet she was still not satisfied and even planned to scam the insurance money with his life. In an instant, he furiously attacked Miyuki. Officer Satoshi saw Tanoshima assaulting someone and immediately rushed over. Believing that Miyuki had called the police, Tanoshima stabbed Miyuki in a fit of rage. Although the officer arrived to subdue Tanoshima and called an ambulance, Miyuki succumbed to her severe injuries. Before her death, she uttered the words, Uramiya. Knowing it's this Uramiya again, Satoshi vowed to find out her identity. From across the lake, Hoya and Uramiya witnessed the entire incident. It seemed that Officer Satoshi would be a formidable opponent in the future. They would have to be extra careful. The seventh story begins with Officer Satoshi having nearly pieced together the entirety of the incident after Tanoshima's arrest. He hoped that Tanoshima would admit to his crimes, but Tanoshima refused, claiming that he was driven to murder by Miyuki and Uramiya. If he didn't kill, he would be killed. To prove his words, Tanoshima gave the officer Uramiya's phone number. As there were no other leads to follow from him, Officer Satoshi could only investigate the given number, but he found nothing. As he was pondering, Uramiya appeared on the street as the woman with long hair. Satoshi shouted at her to stop, but it turned out he had mistaken someone else for her. As Uramiya had already caught the attention of the police, Hoya had to change all her phone numbers. One evening, while Uramiya was visiting a temple fair, she noticed a despondent woman named Miho. She stealthily peeked at Miho's wish plaque, knowing that her business was here. She then skillfully slipped her business card into Miho's bag. As expected, Miho contacted Uramiya later and shared her heartbreaking story. Six months ago, she intended to register for marriage with her boyfriend. However, the office staff informed them that their application was rejected because her boyfriend was already married. This left her boyfriend puzzled, but the staff presented evidence that showed her boyfriend was indeed married to a lady named Michiko. To dissolve the marriage, they would need Michiko's consent. This revelation was too much for Miho and she passed out. She felt deceived by her boyfriend and returned to her parents' home, where her father locked the door and refused her boyfriend's entrance. Her boyfriend apologized to all the friends and relatives who had received the wedding announcement. After that, he stepped in front of a moving vehicle, taking his own life. After losing her boyfriend, Miho realized she couldn't live without him and that she was also expecting his child. Upon reflection, she thought her boyfriend might have been innocent, so she hired Uramiya to investigate Michiko. Michiko was indeed an unusual woman. It took Hoya great effort to find her records. It appeared that she was borrowing money by transferring her residence. Once she maxed out her borrowing limit on one residence, she would move to another and accumulate ill-gotten wealth. Sometime later, Hoya received new information. Michiko's ex-husband and Miho's boyfriend had both died in accidents, and neither of them knew about Michiko's marriage registration. After their deaths, Michiko defrauded 40 million from insurance companies. Michiko's lover was called Hisao, and they lived together in an apartment. Hisao was a chronic gambler who managed to spend 10 million in just a month. He thought the money was ill-gotten and didn't mind spending it, believing they could just defraud more when it ran out. Michiko's father worked at a registration office and her mother at an insurance company, so she knew the loophole in these industries very well. Insurance fraud was incredibly easy for her, and Hisao was responsible for creating the accidents. Miho's boyfriend and Michiko's ex-husband were actually killed by him. 
The two of them were boasting about their plan, unaware that Uramiya had been eavesdropping on them. Miho was filled with hatred for these two and offered to pay extra to have them eliminated. Uramiya quoted a fee of six million for the service. On the other hand, the police's investigations were slow. The young officer was slacking off, often chatting with his girlfriend online during work hours. When Officer Satoshi asked about his progress, he would brush him off, saying he was still looking into it. As a result, Satoshi gave him a stern lecture, which caused the younger officer to hold a grudge. One day, Michiko was once again pretending to be a TV station staff member, conducting personal investigations in search of her targets. Because this involved personal privacy, she frequently encountered cold shoulders. Just then, Shu made his entrance. He had groomed himself to look like a successful young professional, and he asked Michiko out for a meal. He told her that he was the chairman of a listed company, a job that was nothing but profitable as he was in charge of collecting intelligence. He suggested that Michiko invest her money in a profitable stock. Hisao quickly discovered that all the money in their account had been withdrawn by Michiko. Just as he was puzzled, Hoya showed up. He falsely claimed to be Hisao's cousin and wanted to have a chat with Hisao. Afterward, Hoya shared the information he had found with Hisao. He said he had figured out Michiko's modus operandi and discovered her next target, who happened to be Hisao. Hisao thought it was amusing because he believed Hoya didn't know about his relationship with Michiko. However, Hoya presented forged evidence. Not long ago, Michiko had transferred her residence to Hisao's name, making him her natural next target. Just then, Michiko appeared outside the window, arm in arm with the handsome man. At this point, Hisao had to believe it. He realized she had found another man outside, and he had been kept in the dark all along. Hoya added fuel to the fire, telling Hisao that Michiko was planning to get rid of him with this man. He warned Hisao to be careful. When Michiko came home, Hisao beat her up. He presented the evidence and exposed Michiko's lies. However, Michiko was clueless about when she had transferred her residence to Hisao's name. Hisao naturally did not believe her, and he was even less likely to believe that Michiko's relationship with Shu was purely investment-related. Seeing that Michiko resorted to holding a knife for self-defense further solidified Hisao's suspicion. Michiko wanted to escape, but she was stopped by Hisao. After wresting the knife from her, Hisao struck her hard. In her struggle, Michiko managed to open the door. The neighbor heard the commotion and immediately came out to check. At this point, Hisao could not explain the situation. Officer Satoshi arrived after receiving the report and sent Michiko to the ambulance. Hisao was also quickly arrested by the police. Although Michiko was not in mortal danger, the location of her injury was quite particular, causing her to lose the ability to bear children permanently. Even though Miho had taken her revenge, it still didn't feel enough. Uramiya told her that she could always come back if she needed any service in the future. The eighth story begins with the lazy young policeman, Noda, who recently started dating a girl named Otani. They haven't known each other for long before Otani convinced Noda to buy a luxury watch. The price was something Noda could hardly afford. But with her persuasive silver tongue, Otani easily convinced Noda that if he bought the watch, she would hug him and tongue massage him. Thus, Noda purchased the watch. Just after buying the watch, Otani announced that she had to go on a business trip for about eight days. To show his gentlemanly demeanor, Noda wished Otani a smooth journey. That night, a young man named Gotano suddenly confronted Otani, demanding that she return his money. He claimed that the watch Otani had persuaded him to buy was a fake. However, Otani retorted that Gotano had voluntarily bought it himself. Irritated by his persistence, Otani kicked him and insulted him, calling him a country bumpkin. She said it was a great honor for him that a city girl like her would even consider dating him. At this point, Gotano realized that he had been used. While fuming, Gotano found Uramiya's business card. So Gotano sought out Uramiya and shared his story. He had moved from the countryside to Tokyo a year ago and met Otani online. They hit it off instantly and quickly developed a romantic relationship. Otani was Gotano's first girlfriend, and he cherished their relationship. No matter what request Otani made, he would do his best to fulfill it. Even though the luxury watch Otani suggested cost 1.5 million, he didn't hesitate and bought it on credit, as Otani promised a hug and tongue massage once he made the purchase. When Gotano began to question her intentions, Otani put on a pitiful act. Seeing her like this, Gotano blamed himself for doubting his girlfriend. Over the next eight days, Otani was consistently upset, causing Gotano to set aside his concerns about the watch, and thus he missed the return period. Gotano pleaded with Uramiya to stop Otani from tricking other people. Uramiya charged 600,000 for her service. 
After that, Uramiya sent Rina to apply for a job at the luxury watch company. It turned out that Otani was a shill working for this company. She often lured men into buying watches under the guise of romance, earning a commission for each sale. Due to the nature of her job, Otani used fake names each time she started a new relationship. Her real identity was a senior college student. Through a monitor in a necklace, Uramiya and Gotano discovered the truth. They hadn't expected Otani to be so greedy. On the other side, Officer Satoshi had been searching for clues about Uramiya. Due to the lack of leads, the investigation was progressing very little. He smelled a woman's scent on his partner Noda, indicating that he had recently been dating. But Noda denied this. Otani had three close friends. While strolling around, they stumbled upon Uramiya's stall. Upon seeing Otani, Shu pretended to be an old schoolmate, revealing Otani's true character. Otani had once claimed she was a returnee working to earn money for her mother's treatment, all of which turned out to be false. Exposed, Otani quickly left with the trio. That night, Otani was again on the hunt, but this time she was contacted by Suda. She feigned her admiration, pretending to love the doll Suda gave her. After spending a night with Suda, Otani was nearly driven mad, deciding to give up on him. As she reached the bulletin board, she found it crowded with classmates. The board was plastered with posters exposing Otani's acts of deceitfully exploiting men for money. Otani immediately ripped them down. When the trio doubted her, Otani quickly assumed an innocent expression. She soon brainwashed her three friends again, claiming that she was framed by Gotano whose love was unrequited and who sought revenge by tarnishing her reputation with false information. The trio, believing her words, decided to avenge Otani. Otani pleaded with them not to resort to violence while handing them a photo of Gotano and his personal information. Returning home, Otani began to boast about how she'd manipulated so many people and swindled so much money. However, she was unaware that there was a monitor in the doll that Suda had given her. Uramiya and Hoya were watching everything. Not long after, the trio found Gotano. They masked their faces, giving Gotano a severe beating that left him critically injured. The next day, upon seeing the news, they immediately reported to Otani, bragging about how clean their actions were, leaving no evidence behind. Otani feigned remorse, but inside, she was smirking. At that moment, Officer Satoshi and Noda arrived at the school. Noda was shocked to see Otani as a student there. Satoshi prepared to take the trio into custody, but they played dumb, pretending not to understand what he was saying. Thus, Noda played a recording. It turned out that during their assault on Gotano the previous day, Gotano had recorded them. There was no denying it now. Gotano willingly took the beating while recording it. This way, he could receive compensation, and with the money from the trio, he could repay his previous loans and other expenses, including some part of the money spent on Otani. But Uramiya wasn't done yet. She was determined to shatter Otani. Meanwhile, Otani found the professor who had once helped her. She explained to the professor that she had no connection with the trio and asked for help in smoothing things over. However, the professor's attitude towards her suddenly changed for the worse, and he even delivered some bad news. The tourist group that was supposed to be Otani's responsibility had suddenly canceled their trip. As Otani was wondering what happened, Suda suddenly appeared and broke into Otani's home. It turned out that Suda was sent by Hoya, who was still using his boss's identity to assign this mission. He said that Otani was his real wife, but now Otani had gone bad, exploiting men's emotions to swindle money. Therefore, he had to make her reform. In order to make Otani confess her crimes, Suda revealed the monitor hidden in the doll. The video recorded by the monitor had already been sent all over the country. The tourist group decided to cancel the trip after seeing the video. Otani went mad, grabbing a knife to attack Suda. The chase went all the way onto the street, but fortunately, Satoshi and Noda arrived in time to arrest Otani. This time, Otani genuinely cried, but the police were not buying her bullshit. After everything was over, Gotano decided to return to the countryside. He said Uramiya was the best person he had met in Tokyo, which showed how much hardship he had suffered there. After Suda took Hoya's dog for a walk, Hoya found an excuse, saying a person claiming to be the boss had come and asked him to hand over the reward to Suda. In this way, Suda received his commission. The ninth story begins with Rina's friend, Mika, who was hospitalized due to appendicitis. Her attending physician, Toru, was in a rush to finish his shift and enjoy his free time. 
As a result, he did not carefully check the medication he prescribed. The one who fetched the medicine happened to be a novice nurse. Although she felt that something was off with the prescription, she didn't think too much of it. She followed the prescription, prepared the medicine, and injected it into Mika. Not long after the injection, Mika started having severe convulsions. Meanwhile, Toru was enjoying his leisure time, ignoring a call from the hospital. He believed he shouldn't be disturbed while off duty. Despite the rescue efforts, Mika passed away due to ineffective resuscitation. Dr. Izumida inspected the prescription and discovered a serious mistake. The next day, when Toru arrived at the hospital and learned about Mika's death, Dr. Izumida confronted him and the novice nurse. Toru initially thought it was the novice nurse's fault, but upon seeing the prescription, he realized he had prescribed the wrong medication, resulting in Mika's death. Although the hospital tried to cover up the incident, a nurse leaked the news. Mika's mother, overcome with grief, suffered from a mental breakdown. After much difficulty, Mika's father managed to get her into a car. Then, he noticed the business card left by Uramiya and contacted them. Since the hospital didn't acknowledge the incident, Mika's father had no legal recourse. He had previously told the hospital director that mild appendicitis could not result in death, but instead of explaining, the director simply blamed Mika's unfortunate fate. Uramiya initially planned to disguise the scene to look like a medical accident after taking action, but Mika's father refused. He believed that those who depended on their power feared losing it the most. Hence, he hoped Uramiya could find a way to punish the hospital director and Toru. Then, Mika's mother was screaming in the next room. She imagined the straw doll in her hand as the murderer who caused her daughter's death and kept stabbing it with a needle, even piercing her own hand. Soon after Uramiya left, the mother sought them out. As suspected, she wanted to change the content of her husband's request. Soon, Hoya found the relevant information. It turns out Toru is the director's nephew and even set to become the next director. That's why the hospital protected him. Meanwhile, the director summoned the nurse, planning to make her the scapegoat. He had already destroyed the evidence and modified the prescription Toru had written, making the nurse the primary person responsible. Even though a patient had died, Toru showed no remorse. He never intended to heal people in the first place. He became a doctor only because the director promised him good benefits and the chance to inherit his position. Seeing Toru's attitude, the director decided not to let him inherit his position. Toru had already caused the deaths of three patients, and this was the fourth. However, Toru told the director that he had no choice but to let him inherit, as he had evidence of the director embezzling public funds and had copied his account book. Their conversation was overheard by Uramiya. Upon learning that her friend was killed in that way, Rina decided to avenge Mika. The novice nurse was trying to explain to Officer Satoshi that she was being framed, but all the available evidence was against her. Satoshi and Noda both knew that the nurse was the scapegoat. On the other hand, Rina approached Toru's wife under the pretense of delivering a letter. She knocked her out the moment the door was opened. Then Hoya appeared. After putting on gloves, they began to search for the director's account book. At the same time, Uramiya, disguised as a journalist, took the initiative to approach Toru. She presented the recording of the previous conversation between Toru and the director, which revealed many secrets. Toru claimed his innocence, stating that someone coveted the director's position and was trying to frame him. As she was leaving, she said casually that, It's quite easy to kill someone in a hospital. This statement startled Toru. Just then, his wife called to report that the director's account book was missing. Toru was stunned. The next day at work, Toru was still wondering who was against him. Suddenly, a group of police officers arrived to arrest the director. They had gathered sufficient evidence of his embezzlement, and he couldn't escape his crimes. As he was leaving, he ran into Toru and, thinking Toru had betrayed him, he confessed Toru's crimes to the police, intending to bring him down with him. Toru, on the other hand, suspected Dr. Izumida was behind it all and argued with him. In the end, he injected an unsuspecting Izumida, declaring that the director's position was rightfully his. Just then, Mika's mother appeared. She stabbed Toru with a dagger, relentlessly attacking until taking his life. Rina couldn't bear to watch any longer and left the hospital. Her departure was noticed by Officer Satoshi. Satoshi and Noda went upstairs and discovered Toru's body, as well as Mika's mother, who was still stabbing it. The incident made the news and Toru's deeds were exposed. It's then revealed that Mika's mother had approached Uramiya, hoping to end Toru's life with her own hands. She argued that raising a child is hard work, and considering her mental illness, she would be acquitted even if she killed Toru. Therefore, she asked Uramiya to fulfill her wish. 
Later one day, Officer Satoshi suddenly approached Rina. He suspected she was involved in the case because she was in the hospital when Mika's mother committed the murder. Hence, he wanted to take Rina in. During their scuffle, Uramiya's business card fell from Rina's bag, further confirming the officer's suspicions. The tenth story begins with Officer Satoshi suspecting Rina's involvement in the murder case, so he took her to the police station. Rina explained that she went to the hospital to collect information on their wrongdoings, intending to clear Mika's name. She claimed to have found Uramiya's business card in the street. Since there was no definitive evidence, Satoshi attempted to call Uramiya but discovered the number was disconnected. As it turns out, Uramiya had already been informed about the situation through the camera on Rina's chest and had disconnected the number immediately. Because Rina was under police scrutiny, they couldn't use her anymore. After all, Mika's death had affected Rina and might influence her ability to carry out further tasks. Previously, Hoya's pet dog had found Otani's mobile phone. From the phone, they learned that Noda borrowed money at a high interest rate to buy the watch. They decided to target Noda to infiltrate the police department and receive confidential information known only to the police. Saki is a retired policeman who collected many criminals' weaknesses during his tenure. After retirement, he often used this information to blackmail them. When he saw that the owner of a tavern, who had a criminal record, couldn't afford to pay him, Saki planned to use the man's daughter as payment. Terrified, the owner gave all his income to Saki. However, Saki was relentless and demanded 100,000 for the next month, threatening to report him otherwise. Unable to bear the pressure, the owner took his own life. Upon hearing the news of the owner's death, Uramiya rushed to the scene. The owner's daughter also returned and held a vigil with her mother, the owner's wife. During the vigil, the wife received a message with a business card attached, and thus she contacted Uramiya. She explained her husband's situation and asked them to take care of Saki. Although their target this time was a retired policeman, Uramiya accepted the task, setting the reward at 10 million. Five years ago, Saki was suspended for theft and subsequently retired. In his retirement, he began to threaten and extort 20 people with criminal records. All the money he extorted was used for gambling, making him a disgrace to the police force. Those with criminal records had obediently paid Saki. They had lost faith in the police and the legal system. Some also chose to endure for the sake of their families. Upon hearing this, Uramiya decided to take matters into her own hands. She deliberately knocked over Saki's beer, then offered him another beer laced with a sleeping pill as an apology. She then lured Saki to the lakeside step by step with money. Upon seeing a money bag with a large amount of cash in the lake, Saki climbed over the railing. Just then, he felt dizzy and weak, nearly falling into the lake. That's when Uramiya made her appearance, even introducing herself. However, Saki was not an easy prey. He stabbed his own hand with a weapon, using the pain to stay awake. He then shouted out loud to attract the attention of the crowd. Left with no choice, Uramiya had to retreat. Elsewhere, Uramiya made contact with Noda and bought confidential police files from him. Uramiya seemed particularly interested in a certain case file. Meanwhile, Saki went to Officer Satoshi to report what had happened. Based on his description, a female officer sketched a likeness of someone from Uramiya. This puzzled Satoshi. In his memory, Uramiya was supposed to have long black hair, but Saki described her with short brown hair. Satoshi was once Saki's apprentice, so he asked him to find Uramiya as soon as possible. Otherwise, they'd have to shoot a second season. Meanwhile, Uramiya claimed to be the fiancé of Suda's boss and asked Suda to help her forge a suicide note. Believing her story, Suda agreed to help free of charge, feeling honored to assist her. Saki, however, suspected that Uramiya was sent by the dead tavern owner's wife and decided to teach her a lesson. Shu, who was listening outside, quickly disguised himself as a gas company worker and knocked on the lady's door, forcing Saki to let her go. One day, the police station received a letter addressed to Satoshi. The letter contained a recording disc, which led Satoshi and Noda directly to Saki. Previously, when Saki had intended to assault the lady, he had been too arrogant and admitted his past wrongdoings, which Shu had recorded and sent to the police station. Hence, Satoshi was now planning to arrest Saki on charges of intimidation and rape. Upon noticing that, Saki could no longer restrain himself and attacked Satoshi before making his escape. Satoshi told Noda not to pursue and to apply for an arrest warrant. He was confident that Saki wouldn't be able to get far. This was something Saki had taught him in the past. After running to a safe place, Saki found some money on the ground, thing that they wanted to bait him again. But then, he found a letter on the ground. It's his own suicide note, authored by Suda. Uramiya then made her entrance. Although the note had Saki's fingerprints on it, Saki didn't care, believing that a weak woman like her couldn't harm him. 
This time, Uramiya was planning to break the rules and use violence to solve the problem. In the end, Uramiya successfully stabbed Saki to death and gave him a lesson. Once the knife was pulled out, he would die from heavy bleeding before long. Although Saki kept telling himself to stay awake, he couldn't hold on in the end. After accomplishing her task, Uramiya warned the tavern's wife never to reveal that she had sought her help. The lady, understanding the situation, knew better than to expose herself as she was also complicit in the murder. After checking the note and fingerprints, Noda concluded that Saki had ended his own life, but Satoshi insisted that everything was set up by Uramiya. The last story begins with Officer Satoshi and Noda finding the tavern owner's wife and questioning her about Uramiya. She refused to admit she had met her, pretending not to understand what the officer was saying. Left with no other options, Satoshi left. Noda tried to comfort him, suggesting that perhaps Uramiya didn't exist at all. However, Satoshi speculated that someone within the police department was a mole, given how Uramiya had access to so much information. This thought terrified Noda, who had been selling insider police information. The reason Satoshi thought like this was because he had been betrayed multiple times. Over a decade ago, a well-known professor was murdered by an unknown assailant while recording a video for his daughter. The murderer later killed the professor's wife and son as well, with only his daughter surviving. She was later sent to a mental institution due to the trauma. This is the only case, aside from Uramiya's, that Satoshi had never been able to crack. One day, while Suda was walking Hoya's pet dog, a white dog rushed towards them. The old lady holding the white dog was dragged onto the road where she was hit by a car and killed. The driver was surprisingly calm about the incident, even claiming that he had saved the government some pension money. He then drove away. Despite Suda's best efforts, he couldn't catch up to the car, but he was smart enough to remember the license plate number. The patrol cops later responded to Suda's report and eventually stopped the car. The driver turned out to be police inspector Minoru. He was virtually untouchable and enjoyed the privilege. One of the patrol cops, recognizing Minoru, started to grovel and even complied with his request to provide a false statement that his car had been stolen. As a result, the husband of the dead lady could not get justice. Noda understood a high-ranking official had made a mistake and his subordinates were covering up for him. When arriving at home, the old man found a business card from Uramiya in his mailbox. So he made the call, and Uramiya informed him about the police's misconduct. Only then did he realize how naive he had been. But now, Minoru was using his power to cover up the incident. So he asked Uramiya to punish Minoru and find peace for his late wife. Uramiya charged a fee of five million. Despite Minoru's outward power and influence, he was actually a masochist in private. He particularly enjoyed being humiliated and whipped by female companions. After having his fun, Minoru would often boast that the police were just dogs he kept, obedient to his every command. On the other side, Officer Satoshi looked up the license plate number of the vehicle involved in the accident, only to find out that the car belonged to Minoru. He met the chief, questioning if the chief had indeed destroyed Minoru's criminal files. With no outsiders present, the chief confirmed it was an internal decision. He also belittled Satoshi due to his rank, conveying that Minoru was untouchable. The chief hoped Satoshi would discharge this case, promising a promotion was within reach. But Satoshi refused, saying that he would conduct a thorough investigation. This was the reason why he had never been promoted. This infuriated the chief. On the other side, all members of Uramiya were mobilized, determined to bring down Minoru. Shu and Rina, disguised as police officers, retrieved Minoru's car involved in the accident from the repair shop, preventing the destruction of evidence. They then switched it with a new police car that was originally intended for display, attaching evidence of Minoru's crimes to the car. Due to the large number of reporters on the scene, news of this incident was reported immediately, and the police's plan to control the information failed. Upon learning of this, Minoru, who had just killed his female companion, immediately called the chief to unleash a torrent of abuse. He warned the chief to resolve the issue within 24 hours, threatening to transfer him to a remote island otherwise. The chief had no choice but to comply. Hoya had just discovered Minoru's peculiar fetish and the information about his female companion, only to receive news of her death. Before long, the chief and his men kidnapped the old man. Just as they were about to leave, they noticed Satoshi who had come to investigate. The chief was determined to eliminate him, fearing his investigation could topple their scheme. Afterward, they also kidnapped Suda, who was out walking with the pet dog, as both Suda and the old man were eyewitnesses. Luckily, the dog had a camera on it, so Hoya was aware of Suda's abduction. Meanwhile, Uramiya disguised themselves as Minoru's favorite type and proactively sought him out. 
Minoru submitted to Uramiya, but after she revealed her purpose and stated the wrongs Minoru had committed, he quickly seized Uramiya and knocked her out in one strike. When Satoshi couldn't find the old man during his daytime visit, he chose to come back at night, only to find the old man still missing. At this moment, Noda suddenly went berserk, attacking Satoshi. It turned out he had received a call from the chief, who had told him that both he and Satoshi were stray dogs and would be dealt with. To save his own skin, Noda knew he had to prove his loyalty by killing Satoshi. Just as Noda was about to deliver the lethal blow, Satoshi grabbed a toy nearby and struck Noda with it, killing him. Although Satoshi acted in self-defense, Noda's mother tried to blame him for the death, labeling him a murderer. Not long after, Satoshi received a parcel containing a mobile phone, which showed Uramiya's location. He immediately set off to follow it. After dawn, Minoru took Uramiya to an abandoned factory. They were greeted by the chief and another henchman. Minoru refused to admit that he had hit and killed a person with his car, instead claiming his car had been stolen. Upon realizing his impending death, the old man warned Minoru that he couldn't get away with murder. Minoru laughed in response, proclaiming that he was the law and that the bottom dwellers like them had no right to defy him. Minoru planned to kill them all with drugs and spread false news claiming they were all drug addicts. In doing so, no one would believe anything they had ever said. The three of them were all injected. Fortunately, a camera was installed in Yuramiya's button. Hoya and his team were closely watching the situation. Not long after, Minoru suddenly put on a raincoat, claiming it was going to rain. He suddenly pulled out a knife and killed the chief and his henchmen, firmly believing that nothing keeps a secret better than a dead person. He couldn't let anyone else know about this. Minoru was about to leave when Uramiya suddenly woke up and even managed to unlock her handcuffs. It turned out that Suda had switched the drugs with glucose. What's worse, Minoru's comments had all been recorded and sent to major media outlets. The video quickly went viral on the internet. Despite his downfall, Minoru was not willing to give up and prepared for a last stand. At this moment, Rina stepped forward, claiming that if the higher-ups couldn't lead by example, those below would follow suit. However, Minoru didn't bother to listen. Taking advantage of Minoru's distraction, Hoya pushed him down and pulled out a smoke bomb. As Minoru couldn't see, he started shooting blindly. Suddenly, Suda appeared and used a spray to temporarily blind Minoru. In the ensuing chaos, everyone managed to escape. By the time Officer Satoshi arrived, Minoru, who was now blind, was the only one left at the scene. Consequently, Minoru was legally arrested, marking his downfall. Suddenly, Rina realized that Uramiya hadn't escaped with them, but Hoya assured her that they would meet with her again. As it turned out, Uramiya had indeed stayed behind at the abandoned factory and managed to get Satoshi's attention. When the officer rushed to the scene, expecting a final showdown, Uramiya had already left via another route. At that moment, Uramiya dialed her own left-behind phone, telling Satoshi that she is Uramiya and she will show up whenever there is resentment. Satoshi told her that what she was doing was clearly criminal and against justice. Uramiya scoffed at him, saying that there is no effective justice in this world. Satoshi vowed to arrest her no matter what, but Uramiya only responded that she dwelled in darkness beyond his reach and hung up. Satoshi attempted to call back only to find that Uramiya's number had been disconnected. This was too fast. Could it be that Uramiya really was non-existent as Noda had said? As he was leaving, Satoshi suddenly found a necklace at the spot where Uramiya had been. He recognized it as the necklace of the said professor's daughter, believing that Uramiya might be the dead professor's daughter. Following this lead, Satoshi arrived at the mental hospital where the girl had once stayed. Fourteen years ago, the professor's daughter had collapsed after her family was killed. Instead of showing empathy, the police continually asked her to testify, worsening her condition. Fortunately, her condition had now stabilized. It turned out that the girl had been staying in this hospital all along and had never left. Following the director's instructions, the officer found the professor's daughter. To his surprise, she looked exactly like Uramiya. Despite the physical resemblance, their aura was completely different, which dispelled his doubts. Later, Satoshi took some time to pay his respects to Noda. Noda's mother happened to be there and saw him. However, she didn't forgive the officer. Instead, she wished she could tear the officer apart. As Uramiya walked by, she suddenly found an extra business card in her hand. Following the card's information, she found Uramiya and told her about her ordeal, asking her to obliterate Officer Satoshi. Uramiya replied she would do her best. This marked the end of the first season. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.